And my name is Isabela Ratman Kosinska. I come from the Institute for Ecology of Industrial Areas in Katowice. I am coordinator of the LIFE Pro ETB project and also a manager of the Environmental Technologies Verification Body. I am here to talk about the Environmental Technologies Verification Scheme and deliver you some guidance on how to um, how to apply for ETB, how to implement ETB in your project and for your innovative technologies. We are organizing this uh, training together with the Be Water Smart uh, project. Um, I really appreciate the EWW Centrum for inviting me and uh, having the possibility uh, to present to the consortium and also to other members, whoever is interested, on how to verify uh, ET your uh, technology, a water technology under uh, the ETB scheme. So uh, let me start my presentation uh, with a. Let's change. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Please just continue. Uh, so, uh, where I am from, first of all, um, I am one, I'm managing one of the uh, three um, accredited environmental technology verification bodies. We got our accreditation in 2016. Uh, we are accredited to perform uh, ETB for water technologies, materials, uh, and energy technologies, uh, following the ICO 14034 standard, which is the ETB standard uh, about which uh, you will hear uh, in a moment. So uh, I also wanted you, from right from the very beginning, uh, to encourage to take a look on the uh, developments that we have provided under the Light Quality TV project. Uh, we have created a brand new source of ETV information, the ETV Hub. Uh, you can see it. Uh, I will also provide the um, link to this hub uh, later in my presentation. Um, so how we are going to discuss uh, the uh, ETV today? Um, I think we will begin with um, some introduction, what the scheme is, uh, how does it work. Then uh, we, can, we can go um, into the details on what are the requirements and the, what is the application process for ETB. Uh, then uh, I would like to maybe have a short break and uh, then continue with uh, the definition of the performance claim, which is the key aspect uh, when you verify a technology. And then I'm going to give you also some hints if you would like to implement an ETB project uh, in, a, in a research, uh, an ETB in a research project. So uh, the way also the whole training is structured, it's kind of a spiral thing. I will be probably repeating some stuff with a little bit more deep diving, uh, especially into those areas that I know from my experience, but also other verification bodies are in particular problematic to the uh, ETB applicants. So, uh, not to lose in the time, uh, let me uh, start uh, our session first. So, first things first, uh, to give you the basic information uh, on uh, ETB. So, we all know when you develop a new technology that even if you have the best idea and the uh, best prototype, um, it is really not sufficient to find uh, the first uh, early adopter. Uh, water sector in particular is risk aversive and uh, also operates under restrictive uh, legal regulations. Uh, so um, anything new that is to be bought uh, will require really a very strong proof uh, that it uh, works. So uh, one of the key reasons is uh, uh, also the risk factors, uh, the risks that are associating uh, implementation of innovative technologies, uh, technical risks whether that would work in my operational environment, whether the technology would really deliver as, as promised, but also the financial risks. Because when you look at the new uh, environment for financing uh, green innovations and uh, consider also the requirements of the, uh, of the financial institutions, the investors that are related to the EU Green Taxonomy and the ESG reporting, you will see that uh, those risks uh, are really focusing on uh, having um, any investments that really do not harm the environment and result really in reduced environmental uh, impacts. Plus, on, on the top of that, you have also the uh, technical screening uh, criteria of the EU Green Taxonomy that are dedicated to specific economic activities uh, to which those activities must comply and must demonstrate it in a credible uh, way. 
<clears throat> for many innovations, the truth is also that uh, they suffer a very strong competition from established solutions. So if you are a startup or if you are a small company, it might be very, very difficult to um, find out the first um, <clears throat> early adopter, especially when you are when you have not existed or your technology, uh, when you have not existed on the market before or your technology is really a um, uh, breakthrough uh, technology. So, uh, whoever, if you want to really um, bring a new technology on the market, you actually need to deliver four types of proofs. The first proof is the technology proof. The second thing is the um, green performance proof. Then you need uh, the proof on uh, the uh, cost, and you need the proof on the regulatory and legal compliance. So this is what the clients are expecting from you, and they want really hard facts in order to uh, back up your claims of the, the technology. So this is where ETV is actually stepping uh, into the game, because on one hand, you have the strong demand of new environmental technologies that not necessarily fit into all those uh, compliance schemes or the performance cannot be demonstrated in form because they just do not fit into the existing standards uh, or are breakthrough really. So all the jurisdictions and the legal regulations that apply uh, for their new application and operation just do not fit uh, for those new technologies. And on the other hand, so you have the demands very strong, but however you see that there are some strong issues uh, with the with the early uh, adoption. So as I said, this is exactly where ETV steps into the game. So uh, what, it, uh, what it is, uh, actually it is an environmental scheme, a voluntary scheme, which is ba based on a third party confirmation that the claims you made about the performance of your innovative technology are true and are based on credible test data that is generated under quality controlled and quality assured conditions. So uh, there is this famous slogan as that was supplied by one of the uh, manufacturers of, uh, of uh, Verlish, uh, which promoted the product by saying uh, it does exactly what it says in the tin. So this is exactly what ETB is doing. It provides this credible answer uh, to the question of, of the proof that the technology really does uh, what you claim uh, it is doing. Uh, the purpose for establishing ETB were actually revolt to help technology manufacturers, especially SMEs, but also startups to uh, um, to, to have a successful market entrance of the technologies and accelerate the uh, market adoption. But it also was delegated or is delegated to assist technology purchasers, uh, public or private, uh, to select the technologies uh, that they uh, really need and also to get proofs that uh, by installing those technologies or using those products, they're actually improving their environmental uh, performance. Uh, but also to facilitate the implementation of public policies and uh, regulations. So uh, it is not on my slide, but you must know that the scheme uh, until uh, November 2022 was recognized as the, as the European Commission scheme. Uh, it is no longer that case, That is, but the objectives still uh, remain the same. Uh, we, are now, we have now switched into a purely market-driven scheme. Uh, based on the ICO 1434 uh, standard. Nevertheless, the objectives uh, are actually still bad, uh, even for this uh, market driven pool. Uh, right now, the NTV scheme operates based on uh, the document, which is the ICO standard. This standard uh, is called, it's from CBS Environmental Management. It's called Environmental Management Environmental Technology Verification. Uh, so this this um, standard is also a recognized uh, European norm and a national standard that applies in many countries, uh, including uh, Germany. On the Life Pro TV project, we have also developed a new guide for applicants, uh, which you can find out under the ETB Hub EU website as a main reference uh, for you to take a look on how the uh, ETB uh, system works right now as a market to this tool without a program. <clears throat> you definitely want to know who is uh, who apply for ATV. 
Uh, it would be a technology developer, it would be a manufacturer, it would be a provider, or a legally authorized representative of them. So, for example, an investor who would like to know if it is worth investing in the technology uh, and whether he's offering them would really work as the clerk and because he needs this information towards uh, their uh, towards his peers. Uh, where to verify technology right now? You will see that there are, sorry, the numbers are wrong. Uh, you can see there are three uh, verification uh, bodies operational right now. It's ETA Denmark, uh, it's uh, RINA, and it's Institute for Ecology uh, of uh, Industrial Areas. If you go to the ETB Hub website, uh, you will see uh, the uh, contact details under uh, the ETB network to those uh, verification bodies. There are four principles uh, that are critical uh, that make ETB that um, kind of distinguish uh, between the certification and the verification scheme. First of all, the credibility and impartiality. Uh, we are using a fixed process, a pre-normative process, which is defined by the standard to verify the technology, uh, that also guarantees the quality and the impartiality, because in order to apply 14034, uh, the they, uh, also the ICO standard 70 or 20 must be uh, applied, So, which means that the ones who are very the technology must be accredited inspection body type A. And secondly, the credibility and the impartiality is ensured by the fact that we are only using data for verification that complies to the requirements uh, of the ICO 17025, which is the standard for accredited uh, laboratories, which in practice means that uh, any, any, any analytical data, any chemical analysis or measurements, they need to be whenever possible done by an accredited laboratory, if this is not achievable, a clear quality assurance uh, plan must be provided to demonstrate uh, the quality environment for producing the test data that we use to verify the votes. Um, the fact that we uh, use uh, an ICO standards to make the verification uh, provides the recognition. Because the ICO standards and also the standards that are ensuring the quality uh, and the impartiality framework, these are all standards that are working on the level of the World Trade Organization. Uh, and they are also ICO standards, which means that they are globally uh, recognized. Uh, ETB um, is, ensures also completeness of the approach in that sense that we are actually uh, looking into environmental aspects of a technology combined with its uh, with its a technical and functional performance. So this completeness ensures that we are integrating uh, the environmental aspects into the performance that we are verifying, and uh, also ensuring that if we decide to verify technology, it really needs to demonstrate uh, the features of an environmental technology, which means results in uh, less adverse or positive um, impact on the environment compared to the technologies that are currently used in a similar situation. Uh, what makes ETB particularly, uh, particularly uh, distinguishing from the other simplification schemes is this flexibility aspect. Uh, ETB is, has been designed in view of innovative technologies of breakthrough technologies, which means that where we perform ETB, we use a fixed process, which is provided by the ICO standard, with the possibility to modify to uh, Enter the performance parameters to be verified that depend on the technology that is verified. So we use again a fixed process, but the uh, parameters depend on the innovative features and what is relevant to demonstrate the performance of an, of an innovative technology uh, in full. That makes also ETB uh, distinct from a certification scheme. Because in a certification scheme, you have a fixed process and you have also a fixed, um, fixed set of parameters against which you are making the assessment. So that is why some of the certification schemes are not good for innovative technologies, because when everything is fixed, you are not able to demonstrate the uh, innovation uh, of a technology, which is then possibly its uh, competitive advantage of the market. Uh, you will ask probably uh, what water technologies are we considering uh, under ETB. 
Of course, there's a variety of different technologies, uh, in, uh, different technologies uh, that are relevant. So basically, uh, the anything, any technical solutions that apply to drinking water treatment, to removal of chemical and microbiological contamination, anything, any technical applications, technical solutions that apply to industrial water treatment, and of course, any equipment that is um, related to the monitoring of water and wastewater quality. You, this could be any online devices, any sampling devices, uh, whatever comes and helps measure the quality uh, of uh, water and uh, wastewater. Uh, it is important for you to understand that uh, since EDV is no longer operating as a program, the whole process takes part actually between two or, or three entities if testing is required. So you have the applicant, which means it's probably you, uh, your technology. Then there is the verification body who is responsible to implement the whole verification process and a test body that is the supplier of the quality test data that we need in order to verify uh, uh, technology. So basically this kind of a triangle uh, if you don't have a problem, which is the current status of PTV right now. I know that you cannot see much on the slide. It is just to give you a quick overview that the ETV process right now uh, consists of five steps. Uh, it starts with the application phase. Uh, then we have the pre-verification, verification, reporting, and post-verification. And I will detail those stages in a moment. Uh, what is important that uh, before the application, some of the verification bodies like ours, we're also using something that is a legacy of the EU ETB scheme. So this is the quick scan procedure, which is the kind of a first contact uh, step where uh, the applicant uh, is asking if this technology is really a good candidate, and we are checking if we are competent to uh, verify this technology. So this step could also have some more formalized, uh, formalized approach by keeping a kind of a form. Nevertheless, the whole real true verification starts with the application. So what is happening uh, actually at the application? At the application, uh, the verification body typically provides uh, a kind of an application form for the applicant to uh, fill it in. Based on this information, we are um, reviewing this application, uh, reviewing it from the formal point of view, if there is sufficient information, uh, and technical point of view, just to check the eligibility of the technology. So uh, we are um, looking uh, also into the initial performance claim that comes to the application, uh, whether this is something reasonable, something that can be uh, verified. And we also look into available test uh, data uh, that typically is submitted with the, with the application file, even if this data cannot be later on used for the verification. Nevertheless, for example, if you do a claim on the performance, uh, you would expect as a verification body that uh, you have some test data that would back up even your initial claim, so that uh, just keep on that it doesn't come uh, out of the uh, blue. So uh, the critical, I would say, point is uh, the, of the application is first of all stating if the technology is eligible for ATV. Uh, and I will talk later on about how we're doing exactly that because we need to assess the compliance of the technology with the definition of an environmental technology. And secondly, come up with an agreed performance claim to be verified in order to continue our process. So this is with the, agreed, uh, with the agreed performance claim to be verified, we step into the pre-verification. So what is actually happening here is we are breaking down the hypothesis that you presented as a performance claim and agreed with us into the specific parameters that needs to be verified, that need to be measured. And then uh, based on that, uh, we develop a technology-specific verification plan that details exactly how the whole verification uh, will be uh, carried out. Uh, what are the testing requirements, uh, what uh, the methodology needs to be used for each uh, test that needs to be done, and so on. Then, uh, the verification body, uh, once we agreed on the, on the conditions and the requirements, the verification body assesses the test data that have been provided by the client, by the proposer, 
against the requirements that we have agreed together in investigation one. If the test data complies with those requirements, no further testing is needed. If it does not comply, then we ask the applicant to go and do the testing with a, a test body. So that's where the test body actually uh, gets uh, involved. Uh, verification bodies do not perform testing. For that simple reason that we are um, third party bodies, so we cannot verify the results that we have uh, that, we, that we would develop uh, throughout the testing. So this must be done by an independent test body. This test body must be approved by us as a competent test body, and then they can do the testing. So uh, once we get the test data, we uh, and we see that this is complete, that this is relevant, that this is sufficient, that it meets the quality requirements. We move into the reporting phase, which where we uh, develop a verification report that summarizes all the verification activities, and then uh, it also provides a conclusion of the actually achieved performance claim. And uh, if the report is, uh, if the if the data that has been achieved does satisfactory for the client. Then we issue a statement of verification, which summarizes the process, presents the verified performance parameters with the bodies, and then we uh, publish the statement of verification uh, on our website and also on other websites like the ETB Hub to promote the verified uh, technology. And of course, we have no statement and the reports to the clients, uh, to the API. Uh, Post verification <coughs> is an important phase. Because well, it involves actually this uh, this publication uh, of the of the report uh, on the on the website. Uh, yeah, so this is this is a snapshot of the verification process. Um, what I want you to uh, know is that uh, when you come out with the with the with the performance claim at the beginning, uh, the end result uh, may differ in terms of values. Which means that uh, we, the purpose of ETB is not to confirm actually in terms of numbers what you have proposed at the beginning. Uh, the purpose of ETB is to verify this performance and to provide the actual data that have been achieved uh, for uh, the performance of a technology under stated conditions with all the assumptions and the constraints that are defined for its uh, that are defined for its uh, application. So, um, the end result of the verification is uh, actually the verification report and the verification uh, statement. Important fact is that uh, considering that the verification bodies have the status of accredited inspection bodies, uh, those two documents have also the status of inspection body uh, report and an inspection body uh, certificate, which uh, increases the, um, the utility of those uh, of those uh, statements of those um, documents. Uh, what you also need to know that uh, right now, since we do not have a problem, uh, there is no uh, validity of the statement of verification. It remains valid as long as the conditions under which uh, the that under which the technology has been verified apply. Which means that if you, for example, have made any modifications to the technology or the name of the technology changes, uh, or you are implementing a new uh, generation of a technology on the market, the statement will apply only to the generation for which the verification was performed. If you would like to extend the statement into the next generation technology, uh, you will need to contact the verification body, explain the changes in the technology, then the verification body will assess how it affected the verified performance and either request um, reiteration of the, maybe in a limited scope of the verification process, uh, or if these changes, like, I don't know, the change, the, something very simple, like changing the color of the casing or whatever, these are not actually uh, affecting the performance. So, um, Facebook said that is the same issue, uh, directly a new statement of uh, verification. Uh, it's also important to know that ETB requires an index information from the provider uh, about the uh, principles of operation of the technology. Uh, that may uh, refer to some sensitive information. Therefore, the whole ETB process is run under restrictive confidentiality 
which means that uh, whenever you enter into a contractual arrangement with the verification body, the confidentiality uh, is, of course, um, included uh, in, the, in, the, in the process and in the contract. Um, ETD is not oper it's operating based on a dialogue, which means uh, the verification body gets involved, but also the applicant gets involved. Uh, we are in a continuous dialogue. We are agreeing each step of the process. Uh, and uh, so that we are sure that we are following uh, something that is feasible from the ETV point of view, uh, but also something which is in line of the client uh, of, of the client needs. Uh, what ETV is not? It's definitely not a certification scheme, and I have already explained this difference. It's not a pass or fail scheme, which means that uh, we are. The end result, we always get an end result of the verification, which means we always get the numbers, the verified uh, values of performance parameters. When you look into some compliance scheme, where this is a pass or fail uh, scheme, you will get the answer, yes, the technology complies, no, the technology does not comply, you don't get a certificate. With us, you always get the result. Uh, ETB is not aimed to substitute also any testing which is required in order to bring the technology on the market. So if you offer a water technology which uh, has some materials that need to get in contact uh, uh, with drinking water, for example, then you need to test this technology for those requirements uh, regardless if you have ETV or not. ETV is not going to substitute it. So uh, what we are also not dealing with uh, in ETV is uh, we are not checking and not verifying the manufacturing or controlling the manufacturing process like it happens in many certification schemes that apply to products, for example, from the ICO 17065, where besides checking the properties of the product, we are also checking the manufacturing process. EDV is only dealing with uh, the technical with checking, the technical design of a technology is actually uh, delivering the technical performance, the environmental performance, which is promised by the manufacturer uh, or by the technology developer. Uh, the benefits, I will refer to the benefits also at the end. So uh, you remember that at the beginning of my presentation, I told you that you need those four proofs uh, to demonstrate the technology, the new technology to the first adopters. So uh, with the verified performance, uh, you get the data that you need to provide to your client and technology proof. Uh, with the assurance that the technology is an environmental technology and with the verified performance uh, parameters that focus on the environmental performance of the technology, you get uh, the proof to demonstrate that your technology is actually green uh, and uh, without greenwashing, because that's one of the keywords. Um, and that is uh, what uh, the clients also want to get any credible proofs on. You also get um, um, data to demonstrate and ensure the early adopter that the technology work will work in their operational environment. Because when we verify technology, we define under which conditions this performance is achievable, for which materials, for which matrix, you will hear about it later on. Uh, you also get hard data uh, in order to justify the uh, OPEX uh, for your clients, uh, because in many cases, environmental technology seem more expensive in terms of investment, but then you also need to demonstrate how the savings uh, will be achieved uh, once you implement uh, the technology. Uh, this, is the, this is when you need to convince uh, your first cycle. So you can't price data, because uh, if you if you propose a performance claim that includes uh, those savings or is focused on those gains and savings and reduce environmental impacts, uh, the numbers uh, will then uh, talk to your uh, clients as well. Last but not least, I uh, you remember those are more proof that you need demonstrating the um, legal uh, or regulatory compliance. It is not the purpose of ETV to demonstrate directly the legal compliance, but with the data on the verified performance, you may help the user of the technology, the investor, the procurer, the buyer, to demonstrate that once this technology is installed in their facilities, they will be able to comply with some legal regulations. Or um, when they need to get some legal permits for a new investment, 
test data uh, for the technology verified, the verified performance is, may also be relevant to talk to the regulatory and to the permitting uh, bodies. Uh, I guess that these are, there might be some more benefits that may come up during my presentation, uh, so I definitely highlight that. Yeah, so that was all on the, on the, on the session one. I get uh, you got, uh, I hope you got uh, right now a good understanding uh, on uh, what ETV is and how it works. So now uh, I would like to move to our session two, uh, where I would like to present to you actually what are the application uh, requirements for uh, ETV. Let me have some water. Um, the existing standard, the 14034, describes in details what are the required documents if you want to apply for ETV. So what this application file should consist in. Also, as I mentioned, the verification bodies typically have a form uh, that is following those requirements uh, where you provide some information uh, about the technology. So, uh, first of all, uh, what you need to, uh, to specify, of course, your contact details, because we need, uh, we need to know with whom we are going to uh, work together. The second important thing is the description of the technology. Uh, you need to have a unique identifier. Why? Because the, uh, the, the, the verification applies to a specific technology. It could be, for example, your commercial name. It could be a name under which the technology will appear on the market or any other way that would allow to match this verification, the statement of verification, the report of the verification directly with the technology. Uh, then we need also a good, uh, concise uh, description of the technology that will provide what this technology is intended for, so what is its purpose, this, its technical function and purpose, uh, what material or the so-called matrix does it apply, and also how it affects the matrix. I will provide you some examples later on. Uh, of course, you may verify the technology for more than one matrix or for one more than uh, one uh, internet or application. Then we will, we need, you need to provide to the verification body sufficient information so that we are able to understand how your technology works. And this is where this confidentiality is really needed because you need to disclose all the details uh, of your technology so that we see that the design really delivers as you are promising. Uh, then we also need to define if your technology is uh, at a sufficient development status. I will refer to it uh, later on. Basically, we're talking here about TLS 7. Nevertheless, um, we need to be more specific on this. What does it mean that this is ready to enter the market? Uh, of course, if your technology is already on the market, then uh, this issue is uh, is easily covered. Um, we also require that you provide information about the spending of your technology versus the other alternatives uh, that are existing on the market, so on your competitors. And the purpose here is to be able to highlight uh, where your technology performs better compared to those uh, to those. Uh, established technologies or which problem of the users of those established technologies your technology is actually uh, helping to solve. So basically to highlight the benefits, uh, this, this, this distinguished um, and competitive features of your technology, but you must know uh, also what is the current standing of the, of the technologies that are the relevant alternatives. Uh, the key issue that I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation uh, as an eligibility criterion is the question if uh, your technology is really green technology. And for that, we have a procedure that I will explain later on. Nevertheless, uh, you must have some information provided in, uh, in the application file that refers to the major differences concerning positive and negative environmental impacts and aspects of your technology compared to uh, the relevant alternatives to the existing solutions on the market. Um, and the best would be to have this information available, even if uh, in qualitative terms only, for the different uh, life 
cycle stages of your technology. I want to just say here that we are not performing LCA under ETB, but we need to uh, understand where are those uh, differences. Uh, next, of course, you need to provide a performance claim that you would like to, uh, to, to be verified. And again, it has to be quite specific. You need to provide a parameter and value. Uh, then you attach also all the test data you have so that we can see whether it's the test data is backpacking uh, the maturity level of your technology, this performance claim, and so on. Any other things that are required is we also need to, you also need to uh, have an understanding which relevant legal regulations and standards apply to your technology, either in the EU market, if you want to sell it in Europe, or if you want to be more specific on the target market. Uh, why this is required? Because in some of those standards and some of those legal regulations that apply to different technology, there might be some issues that are relevant to the definition of the performance claim and the testing requirements. But we, of course, uh, in this dialogue process, we have to establish uh, which, which, which standards or with regard regulations uh, are we talking about. Uh, yeah, we also want to be sure that your technology at a minimum uh, complies to the legal regulations or regulatory requirements that apply to it. So, for example, if a CE mark is needed for your technology or any kind of a statement that refers, as I said, to the uh, contact with, uh, with the drinking water, we will not check it. We require a declaration from, and it's in the contract, from the uh, applicant that this technology is uh, demonstrating compliance and is likely to demonstrate compliance. You take it on your shoulders. We are not checking that. Um, there might be some other additional information that is needed, of course, uh, if you have uh, any kind, uh, if your technology is a part of a bigger system, we need to know how it works in this larger system, so we will need to provide also the installation and operational requirements and conditions. Uh, the service and maintenance requirements, why this is relevant? Because if you do not have a service and maintenance requirements, when the technology is being tested for ETV, those who are doing the tests I must ensure that the technology is operating properly. And of course, maintenance and services funds are a contributor to a proper operation. Uh, also, some environmental aspects may be related to the maintenance uh, uh, requirements. For example, if we talk about uh, some membranes and you need to make uh, the back flushing, uh, you use uh, some chemicals for that. And if you don't know how to handle those chemicals, you are generating actually an environmental problem. Uh, and uh, if we consider if the technology is environmental or not environmental, we also look into the waste generation aspects. So uh, that is why we also review and uh, demand that you, you have those service and maintenance requirements defined. Uh, so possibly having uh, a service and maintenance and operational environment. Uh, yeah, there may be also some health and safety requirements uh, that are related. This is basically um, uh, also needed if you, if this technology is to be um, visited by us, so that we know uh, that there are no harms uh, to, to 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 the inspectors uh, that could arise uh, from uh, the operation of this technology while we make, for instance, a site visit or the laboratory is doing the testing. Um, we have under that ATV designed uh, a specific tool that allows you to check if you are ready to apply for ATV. This is the self-assessment tool. It is accessible or available uh, from the ATV hub. There is a section called Get Started, and there uh, the self-assessment tool it is 25 questions divided into, I guess, five or seven, seven sections that comply uh, or corresponds to the formal and technical requirements uh, of the ETV application process. What, the, what this tool is actually giving you, it is uh, once you go through uh, some set, a part of the section or the whole tool, uh, the tool is uh, providing you a feedback report where you get, uh, depending on what information you have or uh, what you know or you don't know about technology, it gives you a big report what you should do or why certain documents uh, are needed and how to acquire it. 
So I think it's a valuable tool. Uh, I'm encouraging you, if you are considering PTB, to take a look at it because it really explains also a lot why certain things are needed and what for, and at which stage of the verification uh, process they will be needed. Yeah, so uh, let me first start. So this is this is the agenda for this uh, for this uh, session. Let's go quickly through it. Uh, and start with a question which technologies can be verified or are eligible for ETB. Of course, I have already discussed the issue that we need to be sure that your technology is really like environmental technology. So what does it mean at the beginning of the ICL standard that your technology is an environmental technology? It has to deliver the so-called environmental added value, which means uh, less uh, negative or a positive environmental impact uh, compared to uh, relevant alternatives or technologies or solutions used right now uh, on the market. So it could be anything like removing, preventing, reducing, mitigating pollutants that are released to environment, restoring some resources or being more efficient uh, in terms of energy consumption. Uh, so yeah, so the, except the environmental value typically may apply, for example, to water treatment technologies or some new materials like bio-based uh, technologies. This could be also a technology that is solving an environmental problem that has not been solved before. So it would be quite difficult to find a relative alternative in terms of a technology. You would need to refer it then to the way the problem is being handled or not handled today. And then uh, all, as I said, the monitoring equipment, uh, which is also helping to better measure the parameters that indicate environmental impacts compared to current solutions. Uh, of course, um, and, uh, measuring equipment may also have environmental added value in that sense, that you could imagine a piece of an equipment that uh, where the conventional technology is using uh, single-use materials, Whereas this innovative measurement equipment is an online equipment and it's not using any plastic or whatever, uh, because the technology simply does not need it. Uh, which water technologies? So, uh, as I said, uh, going more into details, uh, anything that uh, for the for the treatment of drinking water, you can have uh, uh, different um, different technical solutions for filtration, for chemical disinfection, for advanced oxidation, for desalination, for example, of seawater. Uh, you may also have uh, any separation techniques, anything that goes to the biological treatment, uh, electrochemical methods, uh, small-scale treatment systems. And these systems could be not only for treat wastewater, but also for the recycling of water and recovery of materials. Uh, so basically, you can say, uh, to recover the value of water, it's not only it's not only uh, something that is conventionally or typically considered as a, as a treatment technology, but also this recovery and recycling aspect should be uh, highlighted here. Especially that we are all suffering um, we are all suffering um, water shortage in Europe, so the topic would be quite important. It could be also some simple devices, like uh, something that is related to stormwater treatment technologies, like any kind of a filters, anything that uh, is relevant to handle with the absence of water in an effective way. Yeah, I guess uh, you have now a clear, uh, yeah, a, a clear understanding what type of technologies uh, could be verified. I guess I was already clear with the measurement um, with the measurement technologies. So uh, let me uh, move to the uh, next slides. Okay, now a little bit more on the uh, eligibility criteria. Uh, when you go into the standards, you will see that there are three key uh, eligibility criteria that uh, apply. So the technology must demonstrate that the compliance to the definition of environmental technology. It must be uh, available uh, at the market readiness sufficient market readiness uh, level, uh, and it must comply in line with the legal uh, regulations. So these are the key three requirements. Uh, well, you will see that uh, we, I still have on the slide a reference to the EU ETV program. Um, well, the scope of accreditation, the current scope of accreditation um, bodies complies still to those uh, technology areas that were uh, valid for the new ETV program. 
So the idea is here that uh, if you, the eligibility also depends if you have a verification body that is accredited to verify your technology. So if this is accredited for a specific technology area. So the eligible technology must fill into this accreditation areas of, uh, of uh, the uh, ETB uh, bodies. So uh, this is what you need to demonstrate in order to be uh, eligible. Uh, if you, I explained to you that we are verifying uh, technology uh, and this compliance with the definition looking into the uh, environmental added value. So what we are considering uh, in when assessing those significant environmental uh, impacts from the, from the life cycle perspective, we look in such parameters as consumption of natural resources, water and energy consumption, emissions to air, water and soil, generation of waste. Remember the case that I told about the membranes, uh, especially hazardous, hazardous waste, noise. So these are all important things that we want to know how the technology delivers compared to the uh, relevant alternatives. It may happen that you don't have this data. You may not have this data, for example, for the um, uh, early stages of uh, LCA uh, of, of, the, of the life cycle that refer to the um, uh, availability and uh, getting the materials that are relevant to manufacture your technology or your solution. For example, if your technology uh, is made of stainless steel and the conventional solutions are also made of stainless steel, probably the difference in the environmental impact at this stage uh, will not will, will be the same, right? Because of the type of material. Uh, the difference may come, for example, uh, at the operation stage, when you have a design uh, of a technology that allows to operate it in a way that it consumes, for example, less energy or uses less water per one ton of processed material. So that will be uh, versus the conventional technology. So that can definitely be uh, an, an, a parameter uh, that we would like to verify, but also a parameter highlighting the significant a positive difference of your technology versus uh, technology uh, that is used con conventionally. Um, for the end of life stage, I can also give you an example. Uh, it would be, you can imagine uh, a device uh, which is, I don't know, monitoring something or a, 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 a test probe or something that uh, conventional uh, is again a single use device. Uh, whereas your device that performs better, looks better measurement or same measurement as the conventional one, has a modular construction, which means it is not discarded completely at the end of life stage, but some parts of it could be recovered. So again, here we will be able to demonstrate an environmental added value and a reduced impact on the environment when you compare it with a conventional uh, with a conventional uh, device. Uh, the application form for EPB typically includes a set of questions to guide you to provide the information. And of course, this part is very often uh, subject to discussion uh, with the applicant so that we have a clear, uh, a clear understanding of the environmental benefits this technology delivers. Which of those benefits needs to be then converted into parameters to be verified? And uh, it also gives us a possibility to make a professional judgment, uh, both on the negative and positive aspects, uh, to decide if those positive aspects are actually balancing those negative ones so that you can consider this environmental, because it's still called added value. So there must be this difference. Right, so this is on the, uh, the environmental uh, added value. Now on the uh, technology readiness level, if you, if you start doing the verification for a premature technology, it will not make sense. For us, the, uh, the, the key issue is that actually what we're verifying is uh, a unit that is identical to the one that will appear on the market. So uh, otherwise, as you can see on the picture, it's really a false start. 
Because if you keep changing things in this technology, we'll also need to go back to the testing, go back to the performance parameters, and go back to the conditions over the technology uh, applies, and that will be a never ending and a very costly history. So uh, remember, you need to have the units that basically will be um, the same as we provide on the market. You need to demonstrate that it operates in a stable way. And this is where we'll be also looking for uh, confirmation of the test data that you will provide us. So that we know that uh, you are not going to change anything concerning the, the, the optimization of the operation. And of course, if you, are, if you want to bring a technology on the market, it needs to have the commercial name I've already, um, or any unique identifier. I've already explained that. And uh, I also explained the operational and the compliant, the operational manual and the compliance uh, aspects. Then, the planning, what do we understand that the technology is already on the market? Uh, it means that uh, the technology and all its components, like all the apparatus, all the processes, and all the products are full scale and commercially available. Then you can call this actually, you know, ready to enter the market. And uh, this is what typically uh, will be used uh, when you have um, a demonstration project of a, or a demonstration of a commercial unit. So the ETB process will apply to this unit. If you have a technology which is a final prototype design, so you can call it a pilot installation, uh, which is prior to its manufacturing or supply of the commercial unit. So it still includes some parts that are unique and not commercially available. Uh, then you will clearly say that also into the verification that it has been uh, the verification has been performed uh, for the uh, pilot only with this and this uh, design. And of course, uh, if uh, you are piloting an installation, we'll also look into the uh, scale up factors just to be sure that uh, if this technology is upscaled it will deliver in a similar way as you are promising. So it would be good uh, for the application to have also information on how the upscaling uh, will affect the performance we're verifying and what are the factors that may affect uh, the performance when uh, upscaled. Uh, of course, we are talking about innovative technology, so we need to be sure how, and you need to know how to demonstrate the innovation. Innovation initially is not about when the technology is provided for the market. It's two years, three years, or not yet now. It's, it's, it's not what we mean by innovation for environmental technologies. The innovation is strictly related to the environmental uh, effect of the technology and typically results from the way it is designed, the type of materials, the raw materials, the energy, uh, the energy involved, the secondary materials it uses, the substitution process, it may uh, involve uh, the, the way it is operated uh, or used and uh, the recyclability or the final disposal compared, again, to the processes that are currently in place or technologies that are being currently used. So just be sure that you understand where your innovation steps from. Uh, the innovation, you can also um, reflect the innovation by saying how better your technology refers to the uh, needs of your client. So what specific problem it solves and uh, um, it may be also the aspect what kind of new opportunities it is creating. Because you can imagine a new technology that can uh, handle in an innovative way or convert into um, an asset, a uh, waste material, then it's no longer, of course, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, probably uh, a treatment technology. Nevertheless, the purpose of it is to convert waste into assets and in that sense, create a new business opportunity. So this is, this is actually this, uh, the way also of demonstrating the um, innovation and uh, fulfilling the expectations of the uh, interested parties. 
I think I've already explained the issue with the compliance uh, of the uh, legal uh, regulation, but as I said, um, as an applicant, you must, you are taking the responsibility for demonstrating the compliance on you. Uh, we as CTV, we're not checking it. We only require a statement uh, from you uh, typically in the contract. Okay, uh, how you describe the technology for verification? Uh, I must tell you that even if uh, you 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 are not that much interested in doing DVD, but you are still kind of listening to this training, this exercise of describing your technology may also guide you to prepare a very good marketing material uh, about your innovative so solution. Because the way the technology needs to present to be presented for the TV is very very concrete and really reflected uh, and focused on the innovative features uh, of your technology and the uh, distinguishing values. So, what you need to provide is uh, you need to define the intended application of the technology uh, by using the following terms. Matrix, which means the material for which the technology is uh, intended for, for which it works. Uh, and this is important because this is also, it should be the same material for which the test data uh, on the performance uh, has been uh, generated. And you need to provide here also some characteristics, technical characteristics of this material. And, and you need to define the purpose, which means a measurable property uh, that is affected by the technology and how it, uh, that is, uh, how it affects the, um, the, the metrics. So it would be anything like removal uh, of uh, the microbiological contamination from wastewater from a diary. So you see that the wastewater is then in the matrix. Removal is the waste of, or elimination is the waste of affecting, uh, and the uh, measurable property would be the percentage of removal. So as you see, it's extremely, um, it's extremely um, concrete. Uh, and we know in many cases that the way that this type of a description is quite challenging for uh, the applicants. So that is why I'm giving you some examples on how this could be formulated. So again, you see municipal wastewater, you provide the matrix, but of course you need to uh, specify a little bit more in depth the wastewater, because if we, for example, talk about removing nutrients, automatically the parameter that will need to be provided of the wastewater is the nutrients content because you cannot remove something that does not exist uh, at the, at the, um, at the, in the uh, indent or in the um, Yeah, reduction is the way of affecting, measurable property is expressed again as a, as a, as a, as a parameter. Uh, here we got another uh, example, this way it is um, for a measurement technology, like detection of something in something expressed as a number, and the matrix of the drinking water. So again, very, very concrete. Uh, of course, the claim always applies to a special and well-defined environments under which those conditions, the, the claim uh, and the, 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 the performance is achieved. So what you need to define is you need to define, define the operational conditions. This is also relevant in that sense that those operational conditions are also transferred and, uh, and become the testing conditions for the technology. And then they go into the statement of verification where they present to the clients uh, information based on which uh, the, the user of the technology is able to define if this technology will fit into his operational environment. So what you need to provide here is, uh, as I said, uh, anything like um, flows or water flows, uh, concentra initial concentrations of something in the, in the matrix. It could be uh, ambient temperature. It could be some process parameters like uh, pressure in the reactor or all these things uh, needs to be provided that are the variables that make influence the performance we right? uh, We of course need some blueprints and diagrams. Typically we request a diagram of a technology, it could be an AutoCAD or whatever. 
but we need to see the, 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 the blueprint just to understand how this technology uh, works. If this is a part of a larger system, we also need uh, to get an understanding how it works in this larger system. Uh, it sometimes, for example, happened that uh, we got a description of the environmental added value. And uh, when we read the drawings, we see that this is a technology that requires water because it, it needs steam. And this is somehow, this aspect is, for example, not reflected as, a, uh, as an aspect, environmental aspect or resource need or water need at the uh, operation base when we assess the environmental added value. Right, so by analyzing all those documents, it also gives us an understanding and maybe identification of some other environmental aspects that we need to consider uh, for the assessment of the environmental uh, added value. Uh, yeah, demonstrating the uh, innovation. Um, I think these questions, um, on the design, on the way of the use of materials, uh, the way the technologies operate, I have already covered them when explaining this, um, when explaining this um, uh, innovation aspect. Nevertheless, you can always come back to it and take a look uh, how you can refer to your technology as innovative one uh, when you will be making the uh, description. Uh, yeah. Some examples, um, this is uh, for design, the innovation in a way uh, a new um, measurement equipment is uh, designed. So the focus on a more precise or more faster uh, measurement uh, at an extended range of different pollutants. So it's the flexibility of use. Um, the user problem solved is that they are getting a faster uh, results compared to a convention, conventional uh, method. And then, as I already explained as well, um, it could be a device which is eliminating plastic from the environment. Uh, for an innovative treatment technology, uh, the or for an ozonation technology, it could also reside from the way it is designed. Um, there is a problem of the user that the oxygen very often is, does not have an equal distribution in the ozonation columns. So the technology could be designed in such a way that it ensures an equal distribution and in this way uh, eliminates the production of cancerogenic ozonation byproducts. Um, Yeah, this is an example of an innovation for uh, water uh, recycling technology uh, that not only allows to recycle water for irrigation purposes, but also uh, creates a product, a water that includes some fertilization substances. So you not only irrigate, but you also fertilize at the same time. So here the innovation is, again, uh, in a way the membrane bioreactor is uh, constructed because uh, it doesn't have this denitrification tank which allows to uh, allows to recover or keep the uh, nutrients uh, recovered from uh, wastewater. And of course, here the performance claim uh, is related to the quality of the affluent and the content of the nutrients that are uh, retained from it. Uh, yeah, on the environmental added value, I think that I'll skip those slides uh, because I have already um, explained that um, in details. So, uh, but what I would like to highlight here is the, once again, is the need to refer your technology to the performance. So environmental impacts of your competitors or the existing solutions. So it's very really worth to know uh, the, those, uh, those impacts if you want to highlight the benefits of your technology. Um, and as I said, uh, typically what we're expecting from the client is, uh, from the applicant, is to have data on the manufacturing and operation. 
that refers to all those emissions uh, and the um, use of resources. However, if you, if you want to highlight also some aspects with the recyclability, something that refers to the uh, circular economy aspects, it would be nice if you would have also this end of life um, information. Uh, once we analyze this environmental added value, it may result in the fact that we may add to the original performance claim some parameters. Uh, for example, if you're, you, you are verified in membrane technology, everybody knows that the membrane technologies uh, are um, extremely, or nanofiltration or whatever, is an extremely energy consuming process. If your client would refer only to the functional, um, to the efficiency of the membranes in terms of purifying the water or wastewater or whatever, then based on the assessment of the environmental added value and knowing the needs of the users, we would definitely add one more parameter, which is the energy efficiency and also the uh, parameter that would refer to uh, the consumption of chemicals for the back flushing uh, if they get clogged. Um, yeah. Um, how, now how to come out with a reasonable performance claim. Uh, what is a performance claim? First of all, it is a short statement that includes a set of technical specifications that must be quantitatively uh, reflected uh, with the numbers that are verifiable through testing and that are representative to the innovative features to the environmental benefits of the technology. Uh, the purpose of ETV is not to verify full performance of a technology because this will be an extremely challenging process and there are typically other schemes that you must use uh, for that. What we're doing under ETV is to focus the performance claim on the, on the snapshot of the technology performance that is most relevant to demonstrate how better it performs or its superior performs or its innovative performs versus the uh, established technologies or uh, competitive technologies um, on the market. And to that, as I have already said, we need also to specify the conditions uh, of testing uh, and, uh, and, and use. So basically, the claim is that this technology intended for this and this purpose, here you see the technology description, with this and this characteristics, performs under these and those conditions like that. So this is your performance claim. Um, I have told you already that ETV is performed in a dialogue. And I told you already that uh, with the application come with the proposal of the claim, that then may get modified uh, through when it comes to the step, step two pre uh, verification, where we actually need to uh, convert the original performance claim into some uh, into some uh, performance parameters to be to be verified. So this is uh, this is what what is actually happening uh, with the claim. I'll maybe skip this uh, this slide. But I wanted to highlight to you that the way the claim is defined is actually affecting the test design for the technology. Because remember, as I said, uh, when we arrive to the pre-verification uh, stage, when we define the verification plan, the verification plan is based on the agreed performance parameters uh, to be uh, relevant. So, uh, of course, since we talk about innovation, uh, the performance claim should be somehow ambitious. So it has, but it also has to be realistic. And that is why I said that it must be based on some previous experiments, some previous testing that you have done. It doesn't make sense that you would claim a 99% removal of something if there is not, if this is not covered in any test that you have done before. So, or if you have only run three tests, 
right? And you claim 99%. It's better to express the claim uh, in a way it removes at a minimum 90% and if through verification we achieve a better result, it will be reflected in the statement. Uh, it is, of course, important that the performance claim is corresponds to the user needs for the specific application of a technology. Uh, this refers both to the parameters and the, the units in which the, in which the claim is expressed. For example, if we have a monitoring equipment for uh, monitoring uh, microbiological contamination, uh, the value of the verification uh, and, and, and the efficiency of the, of the monitoring would be provided in logarithmic values more than, because this is the way that the business practice uh, for those who are providing the set of equipment uh, uses to, to present the, 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 the parameter. Uh, it is also important that uh, those performance parameters correspond with the problem that the technology is solving on the side of the user. That means it doesn't make sense to verify, um, um, again, I'm going back to this monitoring equipment. It doesn't make sense to verify this monitoring equipment uh, for the fact that its casing is done of recycled plastic. Of course, it, it is nice, maybe, but this is not the feature under which this technology will build its competitive advantage on the market. So uh, it's, it's more of the performance of the measurement itself. So it does make sense to verify this technology for, for let's say, a uh, cycle of plastic content in the casing of, of, of this equipment, because this is not much of relevant information uh, for this technology. It could be added, but it's, it, it's definitely not something for verification. Uh, here you can see an example uh, of uh, removal efficiency, so an expression of a performance um, parameter to be to be verified. Uh, we can have um, some more examples uh, on what the claim would uh, refer uh, to. Mm, for the measurement technologies, uh, there's, there is also a whole list of uh, parameters that are characteristic, for example, for monitoring equipment, like the limit of detection, the range of application, the precision, uh, robust, uh, robustness, accuracy, specificity, linearity. So this is, for example, if you would like to validate your technology versus an established uh, monitoring technology. So you probably need to look into all those five uh, parameters. But again, these are just examples. There might be other things. If you are a provider of an innovative technology, uh, you know best. Uh, what applies uh, to uh, to your solution. Um, as I said, the, 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 the key qualities of the performance claim uh, would uh, include really the description of the functioning or performance of the technology in the embedded application, plus all the assumptions that apply to it. The performance claim must be related to the technology so uh, not the environmental management system of a company or any other broader item. Like um, it will be extremely difficult to put a claim on the technology that it uh, uh, it contributes to preserving biodiversity. You really need to go and break it through into specific parameters uh, parameters uh, that would refer to. Also, claiming that this technology is preventing water um, water uh, eutrophization doesn't make sense because it's too generic. You really need to go uh, back to the specific feature of a technology that is eliminating this problem. Um, so it, it has to be something that is really related to the direct uh, environmental uh, direct environmental impact, uh, something that is measurable, quantifiable, and verifiable through uh, tests. Uh, Again, uh, on this slide, uh, you will find uh, more information on the key qualities of the performance claim. 
um, important is the fact that you really should focus on the way it is expressed, so focusing more on the minimum performance that is achievable rather than, um, say, the maximum one. And of course, it has to be uh, unambiguous so that uh, it is clear uh, for us how to inter interpret it so that we are then also at the clients and we are able to break it down into the specific uh, performance uh, parameters. Um, what is important also that when you claim a value for a specific performance parameters, it cannot be below uh, what is the minimum requirement uh, of the legal regulations right now. So if there is a threshold and uh, a legal regulation that says that at the minimum this technology must meet this and this value, uh, we cannot verify a technology that goes below this value. I mean, below in negative sense, where it's not meeting this 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 legal requirement. That is why I said it is quite relevant uh, that you know the legal regulations that apply to the technology uh, on the market of its uh, application. Uh, some examples of the performance claim. Uh, so that was uh, water um, treatment uh, plant. Um, that uh, has been used to treat water or rather an effluent that comes uh, in Scandinavia, especially in Scandinavian countries, uh, where you need to de-ice uh, planes uh, on the field. So it's um, actually um, the initial plan is on the increase of the amount of the dissolved oxygen in water, uh, the reduction of the fall odor, because you are treating the gaseous substances and the reduction of emissions into other bodies uh, of the airport ceramics. So uh, here you can see the different uh, claim, how it was actually uh, done. This, this technology has been verified under the uh, EU uh, program. You can find uh, the performance claim and you can find also all these uh, materials. Uh, of this verification uh, still on the EU Commission website. It will guide you under the water treatment uh, technologies. Uh, here you can also see uh, how precisely the um, intended application has been, uh, has been uh, presented. Uh, and you also see that the performance claim and the intended application uh, includes um, exactly the conditions for which this technology applies. As I said, it's important because it also defines the conditions for uh, the conditions for um, the testing of the technology. So here you see the claim. The claim, uh, as it has been uh, eventually, uh, eventually uh, designed, with all the numbers uh, and all the values. Uh, so this is the way uh, we are expecting to work with you uh, at the definition of the performance claim, just to get uh, this type of uh, performance claim. These are the examples of the um, operational parameters for this technology that have been defined. That's another technology um, for the BioCube system that was a decentralized system for cleaning uh, wastewater from, let's say, summer houses. Again, the intended uh, application, uh, which you can see here, um, very precisely uh, defined uh, by reducing biochemical oxygen demand, uh, COD, BOD, ammonium, and phosphorus below the required values. Uh, what I wanted, however, to highlight here is that um, when you do ETB, uh, you got a value for each verified parameter. And we under ETB, we are not judging if this value is uh, relevant for uh, a given for a given um, regulatory requirement or not. Of course, we check at the beginning if the technology does not perform below that, 
But once in, we got um, information that it actually performs better than the limit, we only provide the values. And that is important because the jurisdictions across the different countries and the requirements may vary. So uh, we are leaving it up to the market actors to see if these values are actually working for them. Uh, here you can see um, how the claim and the uh, conditions for the claim were defined, the outlet requirements. Uh, this is the Danish technology. They're, 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 that is why um, and, and dedicated, the verification was also dedicated to Danish market. So that is why you see that those values are um, really referring to the Danish values. Uh, and uh, there is also a claim that is relevant for the users concerning the energy consumption or rather reduced energy consumption. Maybe I skip this one. Mm. I wanted to highlight some aspects that are quite relevant uh, for you to know and that are also reflected in the self-assessment tool, uh, what you really need to know about your technology. First of all, uh, one of the requirements is the intellectual property rights. So you need to be the sole owner of the technology. If you are not, you need to have an agreement with your partners who would say that I give you a mandate to apply for ETV. You need to have this unique identifier. So you need to name your technology properly so that it is recognized together with a statement. Mm, you need this clear understanding of the intended application of the technology, the purpose, and all these things that we have dis discussed uh, concerning the description. You need to understand well the needs of your users uh, and of your clients, the regulatory aspects of your technology, and also understand and be able to present what is the innovation of your technology, where does it come from, and how it translates into the performance and into the uh, environmental benefits. It will be also beneficial to understand your competitors and why they are your competitors. So what these technologies are doing and what your technology is doing. Uh, yeah, the performance parameters that demonstrate the innovation, have an understanding of the claim, market relevant claim, uh, and how this claim refers to the needs of your uh, clients. And a good also understanding of the positive and negative aspects uh, of your technology. And last but not least, consider also what other certification schemes apply to your technology, because it may turn out to have a discussion if ETB is a relevant scheme for you. Okay, uh, let's continue with our, uh, with our training. Um, yeah, now uh, a little bit what is uh, happening on the um, next uh, step. So uh, basically, uh, you know right now what you need to do uh, in order to prepare an application. I wanted to tell you that um, it's actually not that complicated. Nevertheless, the application process is the most, um, I would say, work intensive from the side of the, of the applicant because there's a lot of information uh, you need to uh, prepare, and we will, we need to uh, review in order to uh, be sure that uh, the application meets the uh, formal as well as the technical requirements uh, of an uh, ETB uh, process. So now we're moving into the pre-verification uh, pre uh, stage, just to give you an explanation of what is happening once we have agreed with you the performance claim. We know the technology, we know it's an environmental technology. We have uh, agreed to the initial performance claim uh, that needs to be uh, verified. So I uh, will we'll start with how we are specifying the performance parameters, uh, the performance claim into performance parameters to be verified. Then talk, I will talk about um, on the requirements of the test data and uh, where you can test your technologies uh, with whom. Uh, and how you should uh, get engaged uh, with the test body. 
So, uh, as I said, the performance claim, although it is already expressed in terms of values and numbers, it is a kind of a hypothesis that we are able to verify and check through the uh, verification process. Now, what we need to do is to take the claim, break it down into all the parameters that refer to the conditions uh, of the technology, to the uh, parameters that refer to the, the matrix or all the variables, uh, so that we know exactly what are the parameters that need to be monitored, that need to be checked during in order to, 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 to uh, verify your uh, claim. So this verification parameters, we may say, are like a set of tools to prove what you're claiming on your technology. So uh, we're, of course, involving uh, the proposer into the, into the whole process. Uh, so we go from what has been agreed with it, when you contacted the verification body with the application phase to the set of those specific parameters uh, that are um, that are applicable to your technology. So uh, this is this slide shows you a kind of a definition of the performance parameters uh, that we are uh, using. You can see that we focus on four different types of parameters, uh, the performance parameters. So this is what refers specifically to the technical and functional performance of a technology, the operational parameters, which are defined the conditions under which this technology performs as you are declaring, environmental parameters. Uh, these are typically parameters that result from the assessment of the environment and its value. Uh, but if your technology has an objective to uh, directly reduce some environmental impacts, performance parameters typically equal with the environmental parameters. And what we can also do is add some additional parameters that are not verified, but nevertheless, they are important from the point of view of your client. This could be, for example, information on, uh, this could be, for example, information uh, on the water footprint of the technology. This could be information on the CO2 uh, emissions uh, reduction if, they, if the technology uh, really uh, provides as an indirect impact uh, this type of benefit. Uh, yeah, but this, this, this will be not verified. It will be only provided in the statement uh, saying that um, these are the additional benefits uh, or additional important information uh, from, uh, uh, for your clients. So uh, this is where the knowledge also of the legal regulations steps uh, into uh, for the for uh, referencing to the specific uh, to the specific performance parameters uh, that we are uh, referring uh, to. Uh, yeah, and uh, here you see also how one of those uh, parameters, uh, how the performance claim for the technology is converted into specific performance parameters. So performance parameters uh, refer to COD, POD, uh, SS, and nitrogen and phosphorus, for example, um, removal or whatever, uh, or removal of some microbiological contaminants. So this is the functional uh, performance of the technology. Operational parameters refer to some other parameters uh, that relate to the conditions under which it is achieved. Environmental parameters could be energy consumption that relates to the uh, use of this uh, technology or chemical consumption, for example, for membrane cleaning. And additional parameters could be the lifetime of the membranes. Again, this is not verified. This is something uh, that uh, you, as a provider of the technology, may put into the statement with our comments that this information comes from you. Uh, yeah, for the technologies that I have presented as a cases, again, here you see uh, how the table has been prepared uh, for this small uh, wastewater treatment uh, system. Uh, what performance parameters were verified, what operational parameters were verified, uh, the environmental parameter here was the power consumption, additional parameters were not uh, concerned. And you see the reference to the claim uh, as well. Uh, this is a similar case uh, when it goes to the uh, de-icing uh, water treatment uh, technology. Again, uh, you see uh, very concrete uh, parameters that uh, refer to it. 
and the conditions under uh, which those performance parameters are uh, achieved. And this is uh, the table filled in for the de-icing uh, affluent uh, treatment. So you see very specific, uh, very specific um, numbers for each parameter. You also have the uh, reference uh, best available techniques values or any other regulatory requirements uh, values specified. Plus, uh, since you have a reference document that defines how those uh, quota the limit values and how the um, how the performance parameters are referred to in, in the reference documents, you also get information what test method is to be used in order to verify this particular uh, parameter that results again from the uh, legal uh, regulations. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit uh, more on it. Um, you can also find uh, examples, different examples, on the definition of the specification of uh, performance parameters in the uh, guide for applicants that we have developed for technologies, uh, other technologies. So there's also a case on the water. Uh, technologies, but also uh, a claim on the technology for recycling of uh, artificial tarps uh, for stadiums, for example, um, and monitoring technology, which is used for uh, monitoring the quality of the biomass. Uh, and I'm strongly encouraging you to take a look at those uh, examples uh, as well. Um, I will probably skip this uh, slide. These technologies that are on the slides, uh, as I said, they have been verified under the EU uh, verification uh, scheme. Uh, now on the requirements for uh, the test data. Uh, the test data is crucial to verify the performance, but it must be quality. Uh, it must be quality test data. It has to be generated under conditions, or as we call it, by a test system that complies to the requirements of ISO 17025. In practice, it means that uh, we are uh, recommending that you do the testing uh, with an accredited uh, laboratory. Uh, and I also wanted to highlight that when you look at the price for the whole the verification process, actually the testing component is the uh, most um, expensive one. Uh, the testing also has to be done compliant to the requirements of the market. So, for example, if you have a technology and the market practice will say that this technology needs to be tested for six months, uh, in order to get uh, the data, because those six months are reflecting, let's say, um, the climatic conditions, uh, then it, it has to be tested by six months. Or if you claim that the technology uh, performs uh, in the range of temperatures, ambient temperature, from zero to 30, it means that uh, we will need to seek um, an environment for testing that is going to ensure this uh, technology, again, if this is a pilot installation that stands somewhere outside, it means testing uh, for, let's say, three months in winter, if you claim that it performs uh, under zero temperatures, up, up to plus 40, it means also to testing it in summer. Uh, if you... Um, the scale of the test, what we also need to define is this, the scale of the test, uh, uh, the, the conditions for the uh, testing, and all this has to be addressed in a very detailed test plan. This test plan is developed by the test body that performs the testing. Nevertheless, it, it is, this test plan has to be, um, has to be uh, approved by us as a, as a verifier. That is important in that sense that when you close the contract with the test body to do the testing, this contract must also include this requirement that uh, we are, as a verification body, engaged in checking this test data, in contacting the test body, uh, and, uh, and, and um, agreeing and providing some comments to the test. 
The test plan has a specific structure. Uh, this is the structure that comes from us that is given to you so that you provide them to the test body uh, and ensure that the test plan, uh, it's like a very detailed testing protocol uh, is specifying which test methods are to be used, what kind of equipment, if this equipment is supervised under ICO 17025, if the people who are doing the sampling are the people who have, who have demonstrated competence to do so and so on. So it's uh, if uh, we we use this um, a detailed test plan templates that includes also uh, information for the test body how to refer to the specific points in this test plan. Uh, when the testing is performed, it is summarized into a test report. This test report also has a template, and uh, well, uh, the test report of course uh, comes then. Uh, to us. What we also do and um, what we also require is that uh, since we need to check how the testing has been done and uh, how the data has been generated, we may request also access from the test body to uh, raw data in order to uh, confirm uh, or be able to trace back how the test data process that arrives to the certain, so certain results uh, has been uh, carried out and whether it has been coming out compliant to the test plan. Uh, of course, when the testing of the technology has to be carried out uh, in conditions that apply to, and to in, in a specific application that applies to your claim. So if your claim uh, refers to uh, a specific uh, metrics like the wastewater that has some specific parameters that would be, I don't know, um, electric conductivity or whatever. Uh, these conditions have to be followed uh, during the testing because if they are not followed, then the samples are not valid. Uh, so that's 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 quite important, and of course, it all needs to be uh, considered uh, in the and detailed in the test plan. Uh, how I have told you that when you apply for ETB, you typically bring a file of the test data with you. Uh, at the verification stage, uh, what we do uh, is we actually assess it um, against the assess those test data against the requirements that are specified in the uh, verification plan. Nevertheless, we start analyzing this data right from the very beginning of the process, just to be sure that whether and give you also a feedback whether this test data can be used for verification at all or whether it could be used only for indicative purposes uh, and you need to uh, perform uh, further, uh, further testing. So uh, this is an uh, example uh, when uh, it's called specific verification protocol but specific verification protocol is the same as the, as the uh, test um, plan. So here you got uh, an example on uh, how we are assessing the test data and how we are assessing uh, the um, specifying uh, what should be verified and, and how with which values uh, and uh, with the which um, with which um, test measurement methods. And this is an example of a test design that is part of the verification plan based on which the test only then develops uh, the test plan. Um, what we also do to ensure the quality of the system is uh, we perform the so-called uh, test system audit. What does it mean? If you bring to us a test of, of a set of test data, and this data looks like uh, having the possibility to be used for verification because it complies with our requirements, or after the testing that you have performed because it was needed because you didn't have the test data, we uh, go and check the system that produced this test data to make its final acceptance. Uh, in practice, it means talking to the test data, uh, checking their procedures, looking into the risks and key points that may affect the quality of the test data, which also means in practice that we have to go and visit the test lab where the testing has been uh, performed and uh, open the test plan 
check, make some uh, sample checks, uh, just to see if the testing has been done uh, in a correct way to give a final uh, green uh, um, light uh, for acceptance of the testing and to confirm your performance. Where are you going to do the testing? Uh, as I said, uh, if the testing involves physical, chemical, microbiological analysis, any types of measurements, uh, it has to be done under accreditation. Uh, with the use of standardized test methods, uh, if there are some other measurements, uh, there could be some other test bodies that are accredited uh, under other standards than ISO 17025 to perform, uh, to perform this type uh, of testing. Nevertheless, we will always require that a quality assurance uh, plan either demonstrated through the accreditation uh, is behind the process that uh, produced the test data. Uh, I have already informed you that we do not, as a verification body, we do not perform the testing. We do not close any contracts, direct contracts for testing with the test body. It's because of the impartiality rule. It is the responsibility of the proposer to find the right test body, come to us. Uh, we approve it. We have a dedicated form uh, to check the competences of the of this laboratory. Uh, and uh, again, the, the proposer closes the contract with the, with the test body, ensuring that we are also engaged in the sense that we uh, approve the test plan, approve the test report, and also perform the test system uh, audit. Uh, the test body is responsible for developing the test plan, uh, for performing the testing and uh, submitting the test report. The important thing is that many accredited laboratories use different templates for uh, developing the test plans and test reports because uh, it is uh, related to their uh, accreditation and the documentation that is under the accreditation. So if this is the case, then what we request is that the test body produces a test plan and a test report on their template, and our required test plan becomes an attachment uh, to, this, uh, to, this, uh, to this document. Um, once we state that we have enough data, the data has been uh, produced in a process that complies with our requirements, we have a good test report, then we can move to the step of verification and actually confirming uh, or uh, concluding on the actually, uh, on the actually uh, achieved performance of the technology, and that's actually end, uh, ends up the whole uh, verification. Uh, process, uh, because we then develop a verification report and a verification statement that reflects those values achieved for the testing. The whole process may seem quite complicated to you because I provided a lot of explanation. In reality, as I said, the key point, the most difficult point is that a good application and the specification of the performance parameters to be verified. Then the rest goes to the test body to do the testing and then you as an applicant gives us a test report and we then uh, analyze the test report and uh, conclude on the verification. Uh, now I would like to finish my presentation with some hints to you uh, concerning how you can involve uh, or have an environmental technology verification uh, in, a, in a research project. Uh, of course, uh, you have seen that uh, the technology has to be market ready uh, for performing ETV. Uh, there are also some funding schemes that you may use uh, for the, uh, to cover the verification costs. For example, the live post-market projects on the development technology, you might include this cost. If your Horizon project also aims at developing a technology beyond uh, or at a minimum TRL7, you may also consider uh, having at the minimum good testing being done uh, and test data that we can uh, use. So, uh, but you have to remember uh, one important thing. Uh, ETB is not for all the colleagues, which means that uh, we really need to try if the scheme fits to demonstrate the innovation purposes. Maybe there are some other certification schemes uh, that are more relevant uh, for the market acceptance of your technology. Uh, also, uh, you need to have to safeguard appropriate uh, time 
and uh, budget to perform uh, verification because it takes it really takes time. If the verification uh, requires testing for half of a year, you can imagine that the whole verification process will last um, at about a year. If the testing is shorter, we may talk about six up to seven months in order to do the testing. If you talk about costs, I would say that you need to stay on the level uh, of 30, 40,000 euros uh, per uh, verification, but this does not differ much uh, from other certifications that uh, you that, that uh, apply. So when ETV brings really a value, uh, it is first of all, when uh, your technology is more expensive, but delivers better values. Uh, so ETV can give you uh, a proof that it really helps and brings a substantial improvement of your client's performance. And as I said, uh, these parameters can be then directly translated into OPEX to show uh, the savings. Uh, if your technology is uh, something that appears uh, not the only solution on the market, there are many similar solutions, ETD may help you to distinguish it. For example, uh, if we talk about uh, low-cost sensors for air quality monitoring, there's really many of those solutions. Uh, the only thing is that uh, none of them probably has a third-party uh, verification of uh, performance. So you can distinguish uh, your technology in that way. Uh, also, when your technology is really a breakthrough solution, uh, the clients or the best doctors may have an issue to understand this technology, so uh, and or and don't have a chance to compare it with anything else. Uh, ETE may help them understand uh, how this technology delivers a, a, a value, plus they can prove that it really works like that. Um, it may ETV may also help you if you are a startup or a new player in the market just to uh, give credibility also to your company uh, that uh, you are actually uh, delivering something uh, that is credible and something that uh, works and performs better than the competitors. Um, then, uh, if your ETV also brings a value when your technology really performs better than uh, and then, but this improvement, this innovation cannot be reflected by any, any other uh, schemes that currently exist, or when your technology applies to uh, or has some features that are not covered by existing uh, certification uh, schemes uh, or would require combining several certification schemes uh, to uh, demonstrate the performance. Uh, I have already told you that uh, it is quite important to find the right timing uh, for the verification. If you start the whole process too early and the technology is not really commercially ready, so you don't have the information on the maintenance, you don't have um, the stability on performance, it doesn't make sense uh, to verify it. On the other hand, if you invested in the technology, you would like to start spending it as quickly as possible. But you need to find the right balance and, uh, you know, uh, find the right time so that you avoid the market failure because you will just not get the, the data or the technology is actually not performing as we're considering uh, during the testing for uh, TV. Uh, and of course, with this premature uh, application for ETV, uh, there are some uh, risks. Uh, for example, if during the process uh, you would see that still some optimization in the process is, is needed or some variables uh, pop up that are actually affecting the performance and it happens uh, during the testing uh, for ETV, then uh, of course the, all the tests will need to be uh, redone and that's time and that's money. Uh, also, uh, the test results may be not the ones that we're expecting, so the performance may not actually be the one that you are thinking about. Uh, but ETD gives you an opportunity to stop the process at any time when you see that this technology is really not delivering, not, not delivering as you are um, expecting. Uh, yeah, as I said, we need 12 months for verification uh, should be considered. Uh, if the technology has a simple um, claim, it could be shorter, I would say, uh, something around uh, six to seven months. Nevertheless, these are the time frames I would live uh, as for uh, verification. 
And now uh, about the applicability of ETB into the different uh, projects. If you are below TRM6 uh, and you consider ETB in the future, I think it will be quite good to start testing and, you know, um, testing and um, thinking about the claim and looking also into the different technologies uh, that are around you to identify what are the unique features and focus the tests on those unique features so that you are able to understand the innovation and how your technology actually performs. If you consider a TNL7, I think uh, it's very important that you, again, you have a clear vision on the performance claim. Uh, you know with what kind of performance parameters are relevant uh, to, to, to back up the claim. You collect data on the variables that may affect the, the, um, affect the uh, performance. You think about the other documents, uh, like the test manual, uh, the, sorry, the operational manual. Uh, you think about uh, environmental impacts. Uh, you try to uh, do any kind of a testing with a clear test plan that already follows um, ETV requirements. Because then uh, this test data is of value and it's uh, really much easier than to define the claim and it also shortens the time for the future generation of a test design and a test plan uh, if you really decide to go for a team. If your project assumes uh, the tier going higher for the technology than tier 7, then you already could, for example, uh, engage with a verification body. So uh, that, and of course, have a clear vision of your, uh, of your performance claim and already uh, set up the testing in such a way that you get the data, quality data that can be directly accepted as, ex as a set of existing data uh, to uh, be considered uh, under, under, uh, under uh, verification. So that you do not need to do the testing uh, under, under verification, but of course it will require that the, that the test plan is somehow approved you know the, again, the variables, you know what to measure uh, exactly, so the operational parameters, you are using accredited test methods and possibly uh, get engaged uh, with an accredited laboratory to uh, get the test uh, results uh, for you. Um, I'm finishing my uh, quite long um, training uh, with a reference uh, to uh, the information sources on ETV. As I said, the, there is an ETB hub created. Um, it has some sections that are dedicated to the macro actors uh, of environmental technologies. Uh, you will find there uh, also the self-assessment tool, the brochure on ETB explaining the benefits. And what is even more important, you will find a comprehensive guide for applicants. Right now it is in English, but we have also a German version and some other language versions uh, available soon. Uh, you have also my contact details here, so if you have a question, uh, please do not hesitate. Contact me either by email uh, or uh, by, uh, by um, telephone. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that this uh, training was uh, useful for you.